Good evening and welcome to another Pikers Progress video. Now, there's no fishing today, unfortunately, but it's going to be the beginning of a series of perhaps three or four videos. This is going to be a fly rod build. Uh, it's a fly rod specifically for pike fishing. So it's a pike fly rod and it is a nine foot, nine weight. It is a bloke. Uh, it is the XGNP model. It's a uh, graphene impregnated. Uh, got this from Bloke Fly Rods uh, off uh, eBay. Mick Ballard, he, he sells quite a lot there on eBay. I'll just show you this one. I paid for this. This was, with postage unpacking, was £86.50. I'll say I got it from eBay. Um, came with a very nice rod bag with its gold bloke logo, logo rather. Uh, you saw there that it was, it was very well packed, came very quickly, signed for no problems at all. So thank you to Mick Bell at Bloke Fly Rods. Oh, also, they sent me this rather nice snood as well with the bloke logo on. So thanks for that, it's a nice touch. So this rod blank, um, the reason I've, I've decided to pick on this one was that I saw a video, I'll link it in the description below. It was uh, a French guy and he was fishing, uh, pike fishing with with this actual rod. Well, it was the, the blank. He's built it himself or he's had it built for him. And some of the power that he was putting into these pike with this rod was phenomenal. Um, double figure fish, not a problem at all. Very special little piece of carbon. Um, we've also got all the furniture to build it as well. So here's the furniture that we bought to build this fly rod. I've got the cork rings for making the handle. And uh, these cork rings are half an inch thick. And I'm going to be going for a full wells handle, which is seven inches long. So these are half an inch, so we need 14 of those. I've also got some different colored ones. We are gonna play around a little bit, maybe do some, uh, some inlay work. I, I've done a bit of that before like a diamond inlet or a checkerboard or more of that when we build the handle. So we've got our cork rings to build the handle. This is going to be our reel seat. This is an Alps reel seat. It's uh, aluminium. It's got a braided silver effect inside these little windows. You probably can't see it on the camera, but uh, yeah, it's very nice, very nice looking reel seat. And we're also going to have a fighting butt on this rod. That is uh, it's a fighting butt. This particular fighting butt doesn't fit this real seat, but there was an adapter kit available. So on when it's all built together, so I'll have the choice of a butt cap, or once I put the adapter kit in place, this can live in my pocket, and should I need it, it can come out and simply screw into place. So we're gonna have a fighting butt on the rod. This is gonna give me the ability just to Put the end of the rod against my body and just give a little bit of leverage sh should i need it um say so it, it is removable so i don't have to stick with it also this black eva uh, that it's finished in if we're going to do some different colored inlays on the cork handle i'm probably going to change that for something that's going to match as well so we need to we're going to be working on that as well um here's my threads so we've got a metallic royal blue and we've got a gold colored uh, this is going to be the main colours of the rod, blue and gold. And I've got a full set of the traditional snake shaped um, fly fishing guides. Full set with the stripping guide and the tip top. They're all in there ready to go. So before we build this rod, we're going to need some special tools. Now we could buy these tools, but this is going to be a one off build. So we're going to make these tools. Now, I've actually already made these tools in the past because I, I have done a bit, quite a bit of rod building. Uh, but I'm going to remake the tools that I made originally. And we'll do them in this video so you can see what's involved. Uh, and talk about the mistakes that I made as well. I did make a number of mistakes the first time I built them. So we'll count those mistakes up and fix them as we go along. So firstly, we're going to need a cork clamp. That is, once all of our corks are glued together, we need a method of clamping them until the glue dries. So we need a cork clamp. Once the cork is all glued and dried, then we need a rod lathe. A rod lathe, um, this is something that we're going to we need to put the cork handle into to 
be able to spin it at high speed and let us work on it with a file or some sandpaper, something like that, and get the perfectly round shape that we want. So we need a rod lathe. We also need a wrapping jig. Now, when I come to put the rod rings on this rod, we need a, rod, uh, a wrapping jig. And that rod will sit in there and the jig will hold my thread under tension and I'll be able to whip all of the rod rings into place with a wrapping jig. Then finally, we need a, dr a rod dryer or a rod turner. And all this is, it is a an electric motor uh, that will we have grip on to the end of the blank at one side. This is when, when we're just about to apply the epoxy finish to the rod whippings. Switch the rod turner on and it will turn very slowly, eight to 10 revolutions per minute perhaps. And this will keep the rod turning. That means that the epoxy won't sink and fall into one place. If you just did your epoxy in on your rod whippings and you didn't move the rod, you, the epoxy would run. Gravity will bring it down and, and it will be really thick at the bottom and probably bare at the top. And that is not what we want. So we have a rod turner and we'll leave that in the rod turner for several hours until that epoxy goes off. So we've got any four tools, was it? Yes, we've got a, so we've got a cork clamp, uh, we've got the rod lathe, the wrapping jig, and the rod dryer. So let's have a look, are we gonna make them? These are my corks that I'm gonna be building the handle with. Now this here is a six millimeter aluminium rod. Well, it's hollow, so I suppose it's a tube, but it's six, six millimeters, got it from b and kind of longer length. Um, but when you get the cork rings, there will be a quarter of an inch thick, one and a quarter inches in diameter, and a quarter inch hole in the middle. Well, the quarter inch is it's near enough six millimeters. Uh, we work in metric, so six millimeters just fits on there, lovely. So when it comes to gluing the corks together, um, we're gonna be getting our glue and a paintbrush, I'm gonna spread it on there, I'm gonna get my cork ring, and press it down, perhaps spin it a little bit, just spread that glue out, and I'll do the same for the next ring, and so on, until all of the cork rings are glued together. And that's what it's gonna look like. So then we need, we need a cork clamp. Well, all this is, is two pieces of threaded bar, or all thread, uh, thread bar, thread rod, no matter, lots of different things. It, you can get this from B&Q, uh, you can get it from Screwfix, Tool Station, any, any DIY kind of place. So we need two lengths of the threaded bar and four wing nuts and four washers. Wing nut washer here, wing nut washer here. And there's three holes drilled into two stout bits of wood. It's as simple as that. So our glued corks on the six millimeter mandrel will go in like that. And you can see what's gonna happen, it's quite obvious. It is just a clamp. So I'm gonna put our wing nuts back on. And our washer. And we're gonna just start to get them nipped down nice and evenly and get them nipped down. And we don't need to go mad. It's not an oak fireplace, it's just cork. It's a very soft material. So you would nip them down and you will see all the glue starting to squeeze out of the joints. And that's about all, all you need to go really, just until the, the glue's seeping out. And then you'd leave that overnight. And the next morning when you come to it, you'd release your clamp. Yep. And your corks will all be glued in place like that. That will be like one piece. So then you'd have to go onto your rod lathe to be able to shape that handle. So like I said, I'll, I'll show you my old rod lathe and I'll show you the one that um, I've built for this video. So this is my old rod lathe. And you see I've got my cork in there and then that's how it would be spinning. And I can work on that with sandpaper, get it to the shape that I want. Uh, I'll show you how it's made. It's quite simple. You can see it's just a frame that holds up a drill. Uh, it's just a cheap drill, from b and I think, it was a few years ago. Um, but it's, re it's got everything that I need because it's reversible. So depending on which way suits me, I can have it revolving two different ways. 
it is um, variable speed so I can adjust the speed and it's got the lock button that is when that's pressed in it will keep running so I can leave that in there and that will be running and I've got both my hands free for working on the, the cork handle and you see it's got this circular collar here now this a plastic handle fitted on there and tightened up and it will have two handle but it's perfect that's my dog it's perfectly the axis of the chuck so on top of the platform here that supports the back and the front of it sits in this hole I'll just turn that so you can see you there and pack with masking tape until that becomes tight fit then you can have a cable cable tie just over the back of the drill there and that will hold the drill in there no problem at all now the two stands that the mandrel goes through the first stand it is built in in front of the chuck and the second one's just a floating one so i can have it whatever distance i'd like i clamp these down onto my workbench um made a bit of a mistake on on these it, these are um the six millimeters internal diameter bearings for these to run on and the outside is um 17 millimeters so i drilled these out to 17 millimeters put the bearings in but they're just too loose a fit so i had to epoxy them in place so that was mistake number one so i need to fix that um secondly if i'm going to be working on that little fighting butt this is going to be in the way so i should have made uh, this bearing carrier separate to the main base of it so that it could float around and i could move them so we need to sort that out as well um, i also made it a little bit too high so when i was work when you're working with a file might be filing your cork rings and of course my face is right in front of front of me view uh, my hands right in front of my face and it's blocking the view so a bit too high if i made it a bit lower i'll be able to have a good view of it while i'm working it so we need to fix some bearings um we need to lower it down a little bit because this is a bit too high and we need to make that first bearing carrier more of a floating one so let's quick make a new one firstly we're going to cut the base for the drill holder and then two short little bits for the side of the drill platform and one more bit that's going to be the roof of the drill platform you can start to take shape now and you can see my old lathe in, in the background it's taller than the new one and I want to make this newer one a little bit shorter I found that when I was using a file to shape cork handles it's not very stable but if I make it a bit shorter I'll be able to use one end of the file on the bed of the lathe the lathe bed and it will just stable it up a little bit so I'm going to mark out for screws now. Uh, you, you'll see me that I'd, I like to use uh, masking tape when I'm doing my marking out. If you make any mistakes, just rip the tape off and put a new bit on and away you go. Uh, but if you do it this way, if you just mark directly on the wood, you've got to rub it out or sand it or it looks unsightly. So I just do it on masking tape, it's just habit. So I'm going to drill out the holes where we've marked. And a little crafty tip here. the um, the, the top of the platform, the four holes there, I need the set four holes for the bottom as well and I'll use the positioning with the drill bit and just line it up, tap the drill bit through and it'll leave a mark. It just saves having to mark out your work twice and then all the holes are going to be countersunk, hide the bed, well it'll uh, it'll bury the head of the screws a little bit so when they're sliding on the lathe bed it's not going to catch it's going to keep everything flat i'm going to glue it up and screw it so if i clamp it all in position while it's glued up and then once i put the screws in you can take the clamps off then the screws are going to hold it so we'll get the drill in the approximate position and I need to measure how high the upright needs to be. This is the upright that's going to uh, go, go over that round collar on the drill. So we've cut the upright and then I'm going to put a, a small pencil into the drill chuck as if it was a drill bit. Just use a, a small pencil, tighten the chuck up and you can mark exactly where the drill centre line is on that upright that you've just cut. So now we're going to drill out the upright where that little 
dot is that we've made the centre line and then the measure the, uh, the, the centre length wise of your upright and that's going to give us the drill positioning and we're going to drill it out with a hole saw just so that it's just a bit bigger than the collar on the drill I'll just cut a little base for your upright screw it together now I'm going to test fit the drill and if everything's okay I'm just going to keep wrapping tape around the collar of that drill so that it's a tight fit into that hole saw that we cut out of the upright. Uh, with the drill now positioned, when you're happy with it, it's a nice tight fit on the collar, packed out with tape. You can cable tie the drill body through that window and it's basically uh, created that, that's the drill part of it. So I'm going to cut a, a bit of longer plank here, two or three foot long, made out the same wood and this is going to act as the lathe bed. I'm going to make two more uprights similar to the upright we just made and these are going to be the bearing carriers. So I'm going to mark and drill the centre of these two bearing carriers like we did for the first upright with a little pencil in the drill bit and it would, that would just give us the height and then we just measure the centre of those uh, uprights and it will give us the position to drill in. So I'm going to drill the bearing holes, that mark that we've made. I'm going to do it with a pilot drill, I'm going to go right the way through. And then I'm going to use a 16mm spade bit. Now the bearings are 17mm, but I'm only using a 16mm. I tend to find that these spade bits, if they're just a slight little bit of run out on them, it's going to make a hole bigger anyway. So if they're 17mm bearings and if I used a 17mm drill, you probably find it's going to be a sloppy fit and the bearing is just going to drop out on its own. So I'm going to drill it out with a 16mm and it will make it a really tight fit. A tight fit, that means we've got to hammer the bearings into each of the bearing carriers. So we get the bearing carriers in the position that you want on the lathe bed. I'm getting them dead on with an off cut on the back of it, just used as a straight edge. And can test fit the mandrel and run the drill as a final test. So here's the new lathe. Well, let's talk about all the little changes that we've made. Firstly, this time we've got a lathe bed and that will screw down on top of my workbench uh, outside. That will screw down there and that means the other components to it they can float around, I can move them around uh, and screw them down wherever I want. I'll screw them into the lathe bed, but it means that the mandrel will always be at the correct height for the chuck. That's the first uh, design change that we've done. It still sits on a platform, the same as it did before. These will screw down, a couple more in there. I want to decide where the bearing carriers go. They'll all screw down to the lathe bed, but it's a bit lowered this time. It makes working with a file now, I'm going to be able to put a block on here and, and just lean on there and I can work with a file now and it, I'm, my vision is not being blocked. Uh, it's the same hole as before, packed it out with tape until it was a tight, whoop, until it's a tight fit, just like we did before. That's with the screw fix hole saw again. So that's the drill carrier part, the actual um, bearing carriers. Got to remember that an electric drill is designed to be using like that, pushing it. So it's gonna have a thrust bearing at the back here. That's how it's designed. When we're using it as a lathe and we're driving this rod and then we're leaning down that way, it's not designed for those kind of forces. You can quickly wear out the bearings in them. So that's why we need some bearing carriers and these will take all of the force rather than your drill. So I've just put these bearings on the screen now. And this time we didn't make the same mistake as the first time. I drilled 16 millimeter, which were undersized. The bearings were 17 millimeters. So they took quite a bit of hammering in, but they really are in there now. They're not gonna drop off. That's great. And the, the, bearing, the second bearing carrier is not fixed now in front of the chuck. That, that's movable, I can move that wherever I want. 
So I've not actually made any handles on this lathe yet, but I've tested it out with the mandrel and it's gonna work just fine. So you'll see more of the lathe uh, when we come to the rod building, uh, the actual handle. Uh, but this video, it's about making these special tools with no special tools. Well, believe me, you don't need any special tools. Uh, you've seen me use an electric chop saw, um, but I, I absolutely love that chop saw. I use it for decking, used it for fencing, used it for little projects like this, but I absolutely love it. As much as I love my electric saw, believe me, you don't need one for knocking up little projects like this. What you do need is one of these. This is the saw for the job. This is called a tenon saw. Uh, these got short blade and it's got a stiffened top edge and it keeps the blade nice and stiff and it's just perfect for making these little cuts, little 90 degree cuts across the grain of the wood on these little projects like this. This is all you need. You also need one of these. This is a bench hook. It's just a piece of, piece of a plank of wood. Got a batten screwed onto one end and then the opposite side, it's got another batten screwed onto that end. Now, when I first started woodwork at secondary school 40 years ago, the first day in woodwork, the entire class had to make one of these. And this followed us round in our school bag for the next five years. And every time we went to woodwork, we had to bring the bench up with us. And woe betide anybody that forgot it. Uh, well, what is it? It's simply, if you've got a table or a bench, anything like that, it will just hooks over the edge. Bench hook. What it does is you get your piece of wood that you're going to cut and you press down and push forward onto the bench hook. It locks it against the table and it locks your piece of wood. So when you're doing your 90 degree cut, it's not going to move on you. You can use it on a table. I'm sat now at my dining room table. If you just pull a board down and the bench up and then just carry on as before. And when you get to the end of your cut and the blade goes through, you're on this board, you're not gonna damage your table. So you can even use a dining room table for it. This is a drill driver, cordless electric drill stroke screwdriver. Uh, you do not need one of these. You do need a drill, but you've got to drill anyway because you're using the drill as the power for the lathe. But you don't need one of those. Um, what we do need, though, is something from the last century. So we'll just go back in time. And I'll show you this device. This is called a screwdriver. This particular one is a Phillips headed right handed screwdriver. It's got a carved handle made from plastic. And this one's even got the craftsman names inscribed on it. He was called Stanley. Here's my rod wrapper that we've just made. Um, before we get into too much detail of this, let's have a look at my old one and see what mistakes that I made. This is my old rod wrapper. And you can see the central carriage doesn't match the wood on this. And that's because originally it was only about that long. It only come in line there. So the thread came up too much of a steeper angle for me. Um, I preferred it a little bit longer, so I did change it later on. And this piece has not been varnished, that's why it's a different color to that. Um, the tensioning spring, I've used a, an old quiver tip here, but the angle that it goes up is too steep. And I've, in order for it to clear the rod, it's got to be bent down quite a bit. And it puts too much tension on the thread. So that needs sorting out. Um, whenever I wanted to move the carriage along, I have to, I'm forever having to tip it up so I can undo the nut at the bottom. It's a pain in the arse. But the trouble is I couldn't have it the other way around because the wing nut would be right in line where the thread goes. So I need to be accessible at the top, but not in the line of the thread. So I need to look at that as well. And finally, the feet on it. I glued and screwed these down to the feet on it and that was the mistake was gluing them because over time these two boards have warped somewhat and it now rocks when I'm working with it it's rocking and it's annoying um, the mistake was gluing the feet if I had just screwed them I could undo the screws pack some paper or a little bit of thin cardboard in there screw them back screw it back together 
and get that wobble out. So we can't, um, can't do that, let's go and make a new one. To make the rod wrapper, first of all, we've got to cut two pieces of wood for the base, which is decide how wide it's going to be. Uh, these two pieces, they're going to have a central channel and the rod supports and the thread carriage are going to slide in this central carriage. Now, the, um, for the central carriage, the guide pegs I'm going to use are going to be bits of the six millimeter aluminium mandrel that we've already talked about. Um, and just to make sure that uh, it's going to be a nice snug fit in there. I'm going to use two seven millimeter drill bits uh, just as a guide while I'm clamping up these two pieces of wood and the, the central channel will be seven mil once the feet are screwed on and the pegs are going to be six mil. So there's going to be one millimeter of play that will slide nicely in there. So I'm going to clamp these together and screw on the feet. I'm not going to glue them in case I need to adjust them later on. So we're going to screw on the feet and next up we've got to make three wooden washers out of some scrap MDF. This is the screw fix hole saw set. Um, we use this quite a lot in the line loading video. If you've not seen that, there is a link just here. But this is, yes, the trusty screw fix hole saw, which is gonna make us three wooden washers. And then we're gonna smooth these off in the drill as well. We just clamp them on a bit of thread bar, not either side, and give them a spin against some sandpaper and make them nice and smooth. Take these three washers and the carriage bolts that we're going to use, they need hammering in. Uh, there's a square section at the end of the carriage bolt and that is the part that's hammered in to the wood and that grips the wood so you don't need a spanner or screwdriver on that end. So we're going to take another piece of wood and make the thread carriage and we're going to knock in the aluminium pegs in the right place and that's going to keep it square to the rod wrapper and it will be able to slide along, adjust it wherever I need it. Make a little square platform here for the adjustment nut. I'm gonna clamp and glue the adjustment nut. Notice how this is being offset. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. And we've got the, uh, the thread storage system, if you like. Uh, the upright for that, that I'm just gonna be glue that in place and it's at a funny angle and the clamp won't fit on there so I'm just using a bit of tape to hold that. Here I'm drilling a one millimeter hole, tiny little drill bit, one millimeter, uh, and this is going to be my spring wire thread tensioner. I've got some piano wire at one millimeter, so that is gonna go into that little tiny hole and we're gonna make our spring wire thread tensioner. Uh, next up, we've got to build two supports for the rods. Uh, the rod blank, that's what the actual rod is going to sit in while you're wrapping the guides. These two supports need a V-shape cutting into them so that they are central to that central channel. Uh, I'm going to glue and screw these together. I'm going to fit guide pegs to the bottom of these and uh, drill a hole through for the adjustment and fit the screws with the wooden washers that we made to this, wing nuts on the top, and the jobs are good. That's the wrapper basically complete. So here it is, here's the wrapper complete. It's a big improvement on the previous version. Uh, we've got a, it's a felt, and sulfur adhesive felt that we've got in there. It, this is the kind of stuff that you put on the bottom of furniture and when you're moving it around the wooden floors, you're not scratching your floor. It's that sulfur adhesive felt stuff. So I'll put that in there. That's gonna protect our rod blank. Uh, as we're winding the, uh, the whippings, they will try and undo themselves. They'll try and unwind the rod because of the tension on it. So we've got these little hair bobble system. They just used a couple of the wife's hair bobbles there. An elastic band and a shiny rod blank, they're going to be quite sticky, but the hair bobbles are covered in a material. So they're nice, quite, they're nice and smooth and it puts enough tension on there so that the rod's not going to try and unwind. The, we got rid of the quiver tip, who you remember before it was coming up quite high and it put too much tension on. All we've used here is a length of spring steel. Uh, this is piano wire. I bought one millimeter piano wire off eBay. I think I bought a meter length for a couple of quid. Um, and that will provide enough tension there. I'll just show you a quick close up. 
So here's the thread reel system. You can see it's just two washers with a spring in between the washers and they push against the end of the thread bobbin. So the thread comes down and it comes through this first eye and it comes along into the second eye and up to where I'm whipping the rod ring onto the rod. And you see the spring steel just keeps everything in tension. So that, that's the piano wire spring that, that seems to work well. I have tested it out. Uh, the threads you saw in the close up, it's basically uh, a few washers and a spring. This threaded bar goes all the way through. That is one piece and that is another piece. It just saves doing it twice. So I just went all the way through and used a piece of that threaded bar. I think this is the six millimeter. And they're locked into position on both sides by a washer and a nut. So the thread system, we have a washer goes on there and we have a little spring and another washer. Then we have our reel of thread and another washer and a wing nut. And I can get the tension correct, just tighten it down against that spring. The spring will keep the tension and the thread reel will be under tension. Anyone that uses a bait caster or a multiplier, they'll, they'll, they'll know that a spool running on its centre axis like that, it just tends to overrun. So I can keep it in tension and it's not going to overrun. The spring, spring steel will also help keep thread in tension. And when I'm winding it onto the rod, the elastic, there's one at each end, that'll hold the rod and it'll stop it trying to unwind itself. So that I'm happy with that. Uh, the centre carriage... The adjustment there, we've offset it from the line of the thread. If you remember the thread, it comes down here through this eye and through this eye with the hook, spring steel hook hooking onto it, give it tension. So we can't have any, any wing nuts in this space here. So we've offset it. Um, for that, we've used some wooden washers that we've made. And we made these out of MDF with the hole saw and smoothed them off. And we fit these two carriage bolts. And you see the carriage bolt there. It doesn't have a slot in for a screwdriver. It doesn't have any flats on for a spanner or an Allen key or anything like that. These are designed to be hammered into wood, as you saw me do. And that, that will lock it onto there. And we've used a, a wooden washer because wooden provides a lot more friction than if it was a metal washer. Oh, yeah, there. And that means that I don't need to reach underneath to hold the bolt from turning. I can just do it from the top there. And there's enough friction from that wooden watcher that we've made. I can do it, we'll do it from above. So I'm not tipping it up. The feet there, it's just been screwed on. I haven't glued them. Learned my lesson. Um, should in the future, these two balls warp and twist a little bit when they dry out and it starts to rock, all I need to do is undo the affected side, put some paper or cardboard in between the foot and the board, just to level it up and then put the screw back in again. So there we are, that's our, our wrapper fully complete. Here's my rod wrapping jig um, with a, a tip section on it. Uh, just imagine that if you're working towards the tip end of the rod, it's gonna be heavy at this end and it's gonna want to tip. That's where these come in. These are just little supplementary stands that I built. It's just the top part of an old rod rest. I've got a little bit of adjustability in there. You, if you haven't got the rod parts, uh, the rod rest parts, just make a, an L shape out of two battens of wood and cut a V in it. That's absolutely fine. That's all you need, but these will be able to support the rod. So if I'm working, oh, getting that in the right place. Hi, well, there we go. That's perfect. So if I'm working on these whippings at the thin part of the rod, the bottom part is being supported. We'll also use these in the, um, in the dryer as well. So uh, once we've done all of our whippings and any trim bands or whatever other designs that we decide to do when we eventually do it and we get the rings on, when they're finished, they need to be um, treated and they will be treated against uh, UV light so that the colour doesn't change in that golden metallic blue that we're going to do and then they'll be coated with uh, the epoxy finish. It's a two-part epoxy mixture and it is brushed on. 
So we, we're going to have a rod dryer and it's going to support the rod for us and it's going to turn the rod. And I'm going to be able to get my epoxy on a little paintbrush and paint that onto my whippings. And the rod dryer will continue to turn it for several hours until that epoxy is hardened. So let's have a look at the rod dryer. So here's our rod dryer. You can see I've got the tip section of a rod that I previously built myself uh, in there just for demonstration. Uh, you can see it's just turning the rod nice and slowly. So like I said, we'll finish all of these whippings with the epoxy and we're gonna leave it in the dryer for several hours. And it'll, it, if the rod was stationary, we will get the epoxy running down. Gravity will bring it down. It'll be bare at the top and big lumpy at the bottom. It wouldn't be very nice. So I want a lovely finish on these. So we're going to use a rod dryer. Uh, it's a little bit intricate, so we'll go in close up to make this. We're going to make the chuck for the rod dryer. The chuck is the, port, the part that grips the rod and the rod dryer will turn it. So we've got to make this chuck. Uh, we've got to make something that's not going to damage the rods and it's going to be easy to put a rod on and off. The way I do it, imagine this pencil is the back end of my blank that I'm going to put in the dryer. Put three small elastic bands onto the end, and then put the end into the chuck. And then I get one of the bands, it goes round one screw and over another. I get another band, it goes round one screw and over another. And then the last one goes round one screw and over another. And you see that holds it pretty central there. And that will turn away in the rod dryer and it will grip the rod no problem. It's not going to damage the rod and obviously just get it out, just pull it. So that's a rod dryer chuck and this is what we're going to make now. Uh, it's made from a blanking plug for 32mm waste pipe. So imagine your kitchen sink or your bathroom sink, the white plastic waste pipe. It's normally 32 millimetres and this is a blanking plug so if you're going to do some work and disconnect everything you get one of these and just push it into the end of the pipe and it would stop any smells or whatever coming up from the drains but that's what this is i'll put a screenshot on the screen for you now so these cost cost about a pound one pound thirty something like that very cheap so the back end of it is 32 millimetres and it's got this little flange on the front here and this flange, it brings it out to 40 millimetres in diameter, that front end is. It's 40 millimetres. So we've got to divide this into three equal parts to put our little nut and bolts through. So I'll show you the easy way to do that. I'm going to do it with a compass. Now, if I just drew a 40 millimetre circle, when I put the plug on top of it, I won't be able to see the circle because the line's going to be just underneath. So I've made the compass just a little bit bigger. I've set it to 22 millimetres. So when I draw the circle, the circle will be 44 millimetres in diameter. So we're just going to draw a circle like that. I keep, I'm going to keep my compass set at that because we can need it again. A ruler and a pencil and then we go right through that centre line, outside the circle, into the circle, through the centre line and back outside the circle again. Just a line like that, that's all I've done. And get our compass again. And where the line we've just drew intersects the circle, we'll put the point of our compass right on there. And then we're going to make a little mark on the circle to the left and a little mark on the circle to the right. Now what we have to do is from the centre circle of the circle to that mark, make a line there. Oh, just need to bring it outside the circle. There we go, you'll see why shortly. Again, another mark centre to the one on the left and outside the circle a little bit. If we ignore that line altogether, we've got our one, two, three. One, two and three portions of the circle. So now when this comes on top, and if you just eyeball it, the circle, make sure you've got a nice even gap all the way around. And now we can see where our marks need to be. So I'm just going to mark onto the blanking plug where those marks are. 
So we've got our one, two, three marks. Now we need to drill for the three nut and bolts. The silver on this one, the first one, but this this one we're making, these are these are four millimeter nut and bolts. I'm gonna get a four millimeter drill bit. And we're going to drill these three holes about 10 cent, about 10 millimeters or the spacing is not critical, but I'm just gonna pop three quick holes in there. You see they go in very easy. Let's go mark number two about the same, about 10 millimeters. And the final one, about 10 millimeters from the lip. There we go. Now our nut and bolts now. Oh. Yeah, they are the right size, just going to be a little tricky because there we go. Let's screw this up. There we go. The second one in. There we go. Third and final one. There we go. That's our, what should we call them? Elastic band retaining screws. We'll call them that, eh? <laughs> now we need a hole in the back of it for joining it onto the motor. Uh, now I found that if I get a washer in there, it just fits in really nice. And it allows me to draw a circle right in the centre. So we've got our circle marked now. And I'm going to go through. This is a 6mm nut and bolt. This is what we're going to use for the spindle that connects to the dryer. The actual motor itself. So I'm going to drill this out with a 6mm. I'm going to put the point of that as near as I can get it in the middle. And that's it. That's all we need. So let's get the nut and bolt. That's going to go through the end there, and that's going to be right in the middle, thanks to our little trick with the washer. I'll just do them finger tight, obviously I'm going to do these with pliers or a little spanner before we use them, maybe even a spot of super glue, just stop them coming undone. So that is our chuck basically done. Uh, let's have a look at motor, and then we'll have a look how we're going to connect the chuck to the motor. So here's our drying motor. This is what the chuck connects to. This is what we've just made. That's the spindle of the motor where they're going to be connected. Um, all this is, it is uh, it's a microwave turntable motor. I'll put a screenshot of what I bought from Amazon up on the screen there. And you see this one comes with the two wires. Uh, some of them come with two spade end connectors that you have to put spade connectors on. Uh, they we're dealing with 240 volts here, so I don't want any exposed connections. So I've gone for the one with the wires, suggest you do the same. Uh, all this is, it's just a, a cable tie holder, just keeps the wires nice and tidy, so I'm not going to catch anything. Uh, they're connected inside this little screw down box that protects the connections. And all it is, is a flex off a bedside lamp. Now you might have an old bedside lamp. Um, I actually bought this one. I'll show you that on screen. The beauty of doing it this way, it becomes it comes with a switch, which is ideal, and it also comes with a three amp fuse. It's about as low as you want to go. Um, don't, it hardly takes any power at all. This little motor. So this is our microwave motor. You see, it's 50 to 60 hertz, 220 to 240 volts. Designed to basically work anywhere in the world. Um, and this one is 8 to 10 revolutions per minute. So the spindle, when it's switched on, will turn around 8 to 10 times per minute. And it comes with an attachment here. It comes with a little flange with some screw holes in. I've just cut this circle with our old friend, the screw fix hole saw. 
Uh, we use that hole saw extensively in the line loading video. So if you're not seeing that, I'll just put a quick uh, link up there. Uh, so that, yeah, the motor is it, not a great deal to say about. It's very easily made, very, very easy. Uh, now, to join them, what I found on the first one, I found this is a pen top lid. Oh, my tape came off with it there. Let's get the tape out. So I got the chuck of the motor packed out with uh, masking tape so that it was a tight fit into this pen lid and we did the same on this motor we packed it out with masking tape so it was tight and that just slips onto there and that couples it together I'm taking this masking tape off because we're going to do it from scratch to build these two up so let's do that let's get some masking tape this is this is what I'm going to use for coupling the chuck to the motor this is just a, a biro pen you can get these well you can have a look what see what you've got uh, this is about eight or nine millimeters in diameter this section of it so it's a loose fit onto the spindle of the motor and also onto the shaft of the chuck um, if I cut off I'm going to just cut square there just where this tapers off here just going to cut that bit off and we'll be able to uh, use this as a coupling to connect these two together I'm going to pack it out with tape so this green section is a tight fit on and we'll pack this out as a tape with some masking tape sorry and that will fit on there so let's get that cut and we'll show you so here we are we've got our pen cut that's the section that we want this is going to be our coupling it's going to connect these uh, the motor to the chuck so what we have to do is build up some masking tape around the shaft until it becomes a tight fit so we'll just quickly get on with that. There we go, it looked like we were a good fit there. Let's test it out. Lovely. So there's our super simple rod turner or rod dryer. Um, I don't think I mentioned it when I was building it, so I will uh, tell you now that the two wires that come out of the motor and are connected to the mains inside this little plastic box it doesn't matter which way round those wires go. If you got them right, that twisted and they went the other way in and you connected them the other way around, the motor would simply turn the other way. That's the only difference. So you really don't need to worry about that. We've got all of the tools made now. So we, all we need to do is get on and build this rod. Don't worry, I've not been assembling the rod without you being here. Uh, this is just held together by masking tape and blue tack. So the next episode we're going to start working on the cork handle. Uh, we're going to figure out the design that we're going to have. We're going to use some uh, different coloured corks and do a little bit of inlay work. Uh, you can get creative. Hopefully it'll work out. We will see. But like I said, this video is going to be a series of perhaps three or four videos. The next one's going to be the handle. Then obviously we're going to have all the whippings and the epoxy finish on the rod. Uh, we've got a reel to get and I'm going with mainly silver metal wear on this rod so we're probably going to look for a, an aluminium or a stainless steel fly reel. We've got a line to get, we've got backing to get, we've got a leader and then we've got to get bike flies. So it's big admission time. I have never actually held a fly rod in my life. I have never done any fly fishing but this channel is called A Piker's Progress and it's about my progress getting through the methods that I already know and trying to improve and learning new stuff as well. Last year, I set myself the goal of going out and catching some pike on surface laws, which I did several times. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, but we did get some days 
where we're getting a lot of follows, but they weren't quite striking on the surface. And I think a fly just fished a few inches below the surface is that could make all the difference on those kind of days. So that's why I want to do this. We're going to, we're going to learn everything. You're going to hopefully you'll be along for the ride as well. Please subscribe if you like my videos. Um, if you do subscribe, just put in the comments that you've subscribed and I will be able to come back and, and I'll say hello. And until then, stay safe and I'll see you in the next video.